the solid principles are five design principles or guidelines that are supposed to help you write better code. I came across the solid principles pretty late into my 20 year plus software development journey. Some of those principles I wished I'd learned on day one. Some of them I wished I'd never even bothered wasting my time with. I'm gonna be ranking each of the five principles from S down to D to see which are the ones worth investing mental energy in and which are the ones you shouldn't even waste your time with. So our first one on the list is the single responsibility principle and this states that a class should have one reason to change. Easier way to put it is a class should only do one thing and one thing only and it should do that one thing really well. To put this plainly it means don't have one piece of code doing lots of different things. Don't have it one piece of code reading from the database or writing to a file or validating input and doing all these things. Rather separate your code into smaller chunks that do isolated things. This sounds pretty straightforward at face value, but once you start working with it, you can quickly realize that it can be quite subjective and tricky to determine what exactly a class's single responsibility should be. What I love about this principle is you don't have to be all hardcore about it. At its core, it just means don't put thousands of lines into a single function. Rather, break that function down into smaller ones. So this principle, you don't need to be all fancy, you don't need to know object-oriented programming. This is just a good rule to break your code up and make it more manageable. It makes it more maintainable, it makes it easier to test, and it makes it easier to read. Yeah, we're gonna make this one an S. And we're gonna make it an S because any level programmer can really start. This is one of the ones I'd want, wish I'd learned on day one. Right, the open close principle. This says your code should be open for extension, but closed to changes. What this principle says is you shouldn't be editing your code. You should rather be adding new code to add the new functionality you need to add. This largely embraces object-oriented programming and suggests that you use a lot of derived classes rather than using simple things like switch statements. This is because every time you edit your code, you've got a chance of breaking something. So this principle suggests you add new code and have your existing code point to the new code to benefit from the new functionality. So what's great about this is it promotes code stability and makes your code more reliable. Yes, that's all good, but the amount of foresight and planning you need to do up front makes it particularly tricky to implement. This one you also need to have quite a bit of knowledge of object-oriented programming. You need to know about, you need to be well up there with your inheritance. So while I think this one's great, I think we're gonna make it an A just because you need that extra skill level of object-oriented in programming and you shouldn't be trying to tackle this one until you first make sure you fully understand inheritance. Next up is the Liskov substitution principle. Terrible name, first of all. Like, who was Liskov anyway? This one can also take some time to get your head around. This principle states that a child class should be able to be replaced by its derived version without really breaking anything. What does that mean? Let's imagine we have a parent class called bird and it has a method called fly. This works completely fine. We have a bunch of derived classes. We have a pigeon, it can fly. We have a falcon, it can fly. But then we have a penguin. Because it inherits from the bird class, it's automatically gonna have a method called fly. But in reality, a penguin can't fly. So here we have a problem, and this is where we have a child not being able to replace its parent class because it can't do the same things that its parent can. Okay, that's all good and fine. How useful is this in our actual world of programming? Well, it does make your design of your classes a lot more robust if you take this into consideration in the first place. However, it does add a lot of complexity ensuring your design strictly adheres to those behaviors at the time you are architecting the whole system. I can't even count on one hand the times that this has been a concern. I wish I'd never wasted my time on this. This took, takes loads of mental effort to grasp but the actual payoff for that effort is almost zero. We're putting this one all the way down at D. Sorry, Barbara Liskov. Next up, we have the ISP, the interface segregation principle. And this states that no client should be forced to depend on interfaces that it doesn't use. This just means that it's better to have lots of small individual specifically purposed interfaces rather than one big general interface. The problem the general interface creates is very similar to the Liskov substitution problem. It's where we end up having a class in implement an interface and then have a bunch of methods that don't actually do anything. We end up having methods that will just throw a uh, not implemented exception. We could actually take that exact same bird example where if we have a interface called iBird 
and it has uh, two methods called eat and fly. This will be completely fine if we have a raven implementing that because a raven eats and flies. But as soon as we get to a penguin, we, the penguin can't implement the iBird interface because it only eats, it doesn't fly. So the idea would be to split those into two interfaces. This principle is completely overrated. Fine, you may end up with a bunch of methods with the not implemented exception being thrown. But honestly, we're gonna put this one up at a B and just because the moment you get to having lots and lots of methods that are throwing the implemented exception, it gets really ugly. But this one's a very easy one to understand. Let's stick it with a B. Then we've got DIP. Lots of people seem to think that this stands for dependency injection. It doesn't. It stands for the dependency inversion principle. This principle states that high level modules should never depend on low level modules. So what this really means is you shouldn't be coding using concrete implementations, but rather you should be coding using abstractions, that is interfaces. This improves decoupling, makes your code easier to test. You can just inject mocks whenever you need to run your tests. All awesome, good stuff. However, it suddenly makes the application considerably more complicated and a lot of applications we often only end up ever having one concrete implementation for every interface so in those situations it ends up just being a lot of complexity for actual no benefit lots of people out there will tell you that you should be able to write code in such a way that you could just swap out any database whichever you want at the time and your application won't even know about it that's completely fine there's a lot of code that goes into that to give you the the ability to swap out a database. How many times have you ever actually done that in a real situation? In my 20 years, I've never done that. I've written a lot of code to be able to do that and has wasted a hell of a lot of time. So this one would get a B. However, dependency injection is so baked into every single framework nowadays and it, it has become such a common place in software development. I feel that it is almost every developer's duty to understand at least dependency injection at least that part of the dependency inversion. So I'm gonna put this one as an A. This is a must learn. So if you've made it through this video and you don't know what an interface is, you should watch this video next to find out all about interfaces. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video.